Well, good morning, church. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff, and this is the online worship service of Big Trees Community Bible Church in Arnold, California, and we're glad that you're with us. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this day you've given us, another opportunity to worship you. This is the day you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Enable us, Lord, to worship you. Lord, no matter what we've gone through in this past year and what we're going to continue to go through, may we put our hope and our trust in you. And thank you, Lord, for watching over your people. We just pray now, enable us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing a song together. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, when I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name of the Lord. Blessed be the glorious name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when the road marked with suffering, there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Lord, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name, oh, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Poured out for all mankind. 
God's only Son, perfect and spotless One. He never sinned, but suffered as if He did. All authority, every victory is yours. we just don't know what to do. There have been a lot of those times lately, haven't there? But we go to Him. We turn to Him. Lord, I 
just trust your perfect plan when I don't know what to do. I'll lift my hands when I don't know what to say. I'll speak your praise when I don't know where to go. I'll run to your throne when I don't know what to think. I'll stand on your truth when I don't know what to do. I'll speak your praise when I don't know where to go. I'll run to your throne when I don't know what to think. I'll stand on your truth when I don't know what to do. I bow my knees, send your perfect peace, send your perfect peace, Lord. As I lift my hands, let your healing come, let your healing come to me. As I bow my knees, send your perfect peace, send your perfect peace, Lord. As I lift my hands, let your healing come, let your healing come to me. don't know what to do I'll lift my hands when I don't know what to say I'll speak your praise when I don't know where to go I'll run to your throne when I don't know what to think I'll stand on your truth when I don't know what to do I'll lift my hands when I don't know what to say. I'll speak your praise when I don't know where to go. I'll run to your throne when I don't know what to think. I'll stand on your truth when I don't know what to do. When I don't know what to do. Well, let's take a little break. Take some time for some announcements. This week, uh, given the holidays, we'll not have Lord teach us to pray, but we'll be back on cycle the next week and looking forward to that as always to get together and and take our needs to the Lord and, and to, to pray together. Um, let's see, what else have we got going on? Um, pretty much this week, you're just going to allow you the opportunity to, to spend some time either with those that are closest to you, or for many of us, we're just kind of laying, taking it easy and staying home, and that's probably just as well in this time. But whatever, we hope that you have a, a meaningful uh New Year's Eve as well as uh, finishing up this Christmas season. Uh, if you'd like to give to the church, um, and you, some of you might be thinking about those end time, end time, end of the year gifts, end of time gifts, that even sounds more ominous, doesn't it? The end of the year gift, uh, you want to make sure you get those in pretty quickly, but you can send them to the church, uh, P.O. Box 527, Arnold, California, write it out to Big Trees Community Bible Church. P.O. Box 527, Arnold, California, 95223. Or you can go online and give that way. Um, 
So go to BigTreesChurch.com and follow the links to online giving where you'll find a secure page to enter your information and you can give that way as well. All right, well, let's uh, continue on with our worship time. We're going to sing a hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. Attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well. prayer this morning. Thank you, Father, for the assurance that we have that we are yours and that our hope is an eternal hope. That this life is not all that there is, but there is eternal life that goes on beyond the grave. Thank you, Lord, for that hope of eternal life. Thank you, uh, Father, for being with us in the midst of the struggles and the trials and the temptations and all the trouble that we go through in this life. May we 
find peace in the storm. May we find joy in the midst of the turmoil. May we find you to be present with us, whatever we may face. We thank you, Father, that you promise to be with us. You've not promised that there won't be troubles. You, won't, you haven't promised uh, that life is always fair, but you have promised to be with us. And so thank you for walking with us in the midst of the storms of life. Lord, you know where each of us is this morning, and we just would pray um, for those that are grieving that they would find hope in you, consolation and peace. So Lord, it's a difficult time of year for those who've lost loved ones, and many of us have. And we pray, Father, for your consolation. For those that are feeling lonely in this season, isolated, and uh, or there's so many uh, sacrifices that we have had to experience this year, and we just would pray that we might find fellowship with you, and that you just be with us and bring us joy even in the midst of our sorrows. Lord, be with those that are going through physical problems, for those facing cancer and tumors and uh, other diseases. Um, we ask, Lord, you'd be the Lord, their healer. We put them in your hands now. We pray, Father, for those that are grieving, that they would find peace and hope in you. For those that have financial needs, that you would meet every need according to your glorious riches. For those families that are struggling, need reconciliation or healing um, of relationships, or just need hope, Lord, I pray that you give them what they need. For those that are looking for a second chance, we pray, Lord, that you would be indeed the God of a second chance and maybe a third or fourth. Lord, uh, thank you that you are the God of hope and that you fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in you. And uh, so we pray that you might continue to do that by your spirit. Lord, we pray that you would uh, just continue to work in our congregation and enable us, Lord, to be fruitful in everything you call us to be, everything you call us to do. May it uh, indeed bear much fruit on your behalf for your glory. And now, Lord, we pray you would take your word and make it powerful, living, active, sharper than a double-edged sword. May it be like the hammer that breaks the rock in pieces, as Jeremiah said. Uh, Lord, that our hearts would hear from you today, whatever it is you want to say to each of us. Take it by your spirit and apply it to our lives Lord, we want to be hearers, but more importantly, we want to be doers of your word. So speak to us today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In Acts chapter 4, is where we're beginning. Acts chapter 4 and beginning in verse 23, which is where we left off back in November sometime. <laughs> it seems like it's been forever now. Um, But we're in the midst of the story where Peter and John were healing the lame man. And they, of course, uh, got in trouble because of that act of mercy on their part. And because of the miracle that took place. And then they began to preach that the risen Jesus had been the one who had um, brought the healing to this man. And that, of course, got them in big trouble with the Sadducees, who didn't believe in resurrection. And it got them in trouble with the temple priests and, um, and just all kinds of the religious authorities. And uh, they gave them a hard time and told them to be quiet. And they told them, no, we can't be quiet. We have to keep on preaching what we have seen and heard. Um, and upon that being threatened, we read in verse 23 these words. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up, and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate 
met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they'd prayed, the place they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. When in trouble, what are you going to do? When you get in trouble, when you find yourself in a tough place, what do you do? Well, there's something that we can learn, I think, from the example of Peter and John and the disciples, the apostles, and those that were a part of that young uh, church in the days in Acts chapter 4. And the first thing that they did was they got together to pray. When in trouble, pray. J.K. Rowling wrote, I don't go looking for trouble. Trouble usually finds me. (laughs) Can you relate to that? There's something about trouble, and it seems like if you read the scriptures, God's people often find themselves in trouble. Uh, G.K. Chesterton had said it this way, Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be completely fearless, absurdly happy, and in constant trouble. (laughs) And sometimes that seems to be the case. It certainly is the case in this text. The religious authorities at the temple had all come against Peter and John. They had come against the the work of God. They'd come against this miracle that had taken place. And all the people who were praising God because of what God was doing, they didn't know what to do about it, but they were sure that this was a problem that needed to be fixed. And they began to threaten Peter and John and tell them to shut up. Stop preaching about Jesus. Stop talking about resurrection. This this thing just has to stop. I've always liked the quote by uh, John Lloyd Ogilvie when he said, It's a great comfort to know that God's faithful people have always been in trouble. In fact, it's the sure sign we're following God and not men. (laughs) Um, Now, of course, we could take that to some extreme. Sometimes we get in trouble of our own making, and that's not what we're talking about. But sometimes when following God, we find ourselves in places where we're not understood and where we do find ourselves in trouble. And I guarantee you that each of us knows that in this life there are trials and there is tribulation. There are all kinds of things that go on in this life that we just don't know what to do about. And the only thing that we can do is go to God and pray. So are you in trouble this morning? (laughs) Well, I don't know about your situation, but we often do find ourselves experiencing troubles in this life. And in those those times, we need to turn to the Lord. F.F. Bruce, looking at this text, says, The Sanhedrin might threaten, but their threats called not for fear and silence, for increased boldness of speech. Indeed, in the example of the apostles here, we see them confronted by this demand that they be quiet, and they prayed that they would be more bold. So what do you do when you get in trouble? Well, trouble is always an invitation to gather and to pray. Trouble is always an invitation to gather and to pray. And that's exactly what they did. Verse 23. On their release from these religious leaders who had been threatening them, Peter and John went back to their own people. Now, who are their own here? These would be the other disciples of Jesus. It would be their their family and friends, but mostly those believers who had been gathering together. They were those that were there at Pentecost. 
Um, they were those that were meeting in the temple courts and in their homes, gladly eating together with, with glad and sincere hearts. This young group of this church that had begun just perhaps weeks earlier, uh, these are the ones that they went back to. And so they, they gathered with God's people. And the first thing they did is they reported everything that happened to them. All that the chief priests had said, all that the elders had said to them. And it says in verse 24, When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. You see, their first reaction when they got into trouble was to gather with God's people and petition the Lord. To bring the matter before the Lord. And it's interesting how they put it here. It says, in the NIV, it says they raised their voices together. More literally, it's, it's like with one voice they prayed. Which says something about the unity that they have as they come together to pray. So their first instinct was to unite with other believers and to pray. Now, I don't know if that's your first instinct. I think for many of us, it's not our first instinct. But for them, they knew the power of God. They knew the sovereign hand of God, that he was under their care. And they knew that what they needed to do was get together and to pray about the situation. So they prayed with one heart. And it's interesting, the language it uses when they do pray in the book of Acts. Notice every chapter just about in the book of Acts, they're praying about something. Now, Armand Gesswein said that they were praying in every chapter but two, and in those two chapters, they were in trouble. So I don't know, you can figure it out for yourself. But in any case, it often talks about them praying in one accord, or with one heart, or with one voice. It talks about how they have united together, and they have a common purpose in their praying. And that's the way that intercession ought to be. That's the way that corporate prayer ought to be. That we come together to get the heart of God about a situation, and then with one heart and one voice and one mind, we cry out to God together on behalf of the need that has been expressed. So their first instinct is to gather to pray. In a very real way, this is koinonia. This is koinonia in action. John Stott talks about it that way, and I like what he says here. He says, On their release, they went straight to their own people and reported everything the council had said to them, and then immediately turned together in prayer to God. Here is an example of Christian koinonia in action. And of course, that Greek word koinonia is the word we get fellowship from, right? Um, and here he's saying that as they gathered together in common, with one voice and one heart and one accord, as they prayed together, they were fellowshipping. I don't think if we often think of fellowship in those terms, do we? We tend to think it's getting together for coffee and, and small talk or something like that. But koinonia is about that common bond we have in Christ. And there is nothing that makes that bond stronger there's nothing that builds that bond of fellowship more than when we gather together and really care for and pray for one another. Indeed, this is koinonia in action through prayer. I found in my own life that our common bond in Christ, our fellowship, is strengthened as we pray with one another and as we continue to pray for one another. There is something powerful about praying about a situation that binds us together with ever in more intense fellowship. And that seems to be what happens in the early church. They're constantly getting together and they're praying for each other. And whenever something arises and they don't know what to do about it, well, let's get back to prayer. And that's exactly what we see here. A couple other things about how they prayed, and then we'll look at what they prayed. They turn to the scriptures. They quote the psalm. They quote Psalm 2 here. And I think that's instructive in a lot of different ways. The psalms were given to us to teach us how to pray. And if you want to learn how to pray, there's no better way than to start out with a psalm. And in the early church, they knew these psalms because they prayed them so much that it just almost seemed like second nature to find a psalm that seemed to fit their circumstance. 
And in this case, they saw a situation where Psalm 2 seemed to fit exactly where they were at. And so they began the prayer by quoting from Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. They saw this, uh, this opposition to the gospel as kind of an expression of what Psalm 2 was talking about, where the nations are rising up and the kings are rising up. The governing authorities are rising up against the people of God and against what God is trying to do. And so in this psalm, they found a foundation for their praying. And so often that's the way it works. When we pray, whether individually or we gather together to pray, we try to find scriptures that can be the foundations for our praying. And the Psalms are especially helpful in this regard. The Psalms lead us to worship. Now, not all Psalms are worship Psalms. There are a lot of different kinds of Psalms, but often the Psalms will lead us to worship, reminding us about the greatness and the glory of who our God is. And as we think about who He is and all of His greatness and glory here in His sovereign Lordship, that gives us a foundation to pray him. Um, Here they celebrate the character of God, that God sovereignly cares for his people and sovereignly cares for all things. And this becomes a foundation for their praying. The more we realize who God is, it gives us an incentive to pray boldly and to pray with faith. When we realize that God is almighty God, that there's nothing too difficult for him. When we realize that God is good and generous and loving and gracious and merciful, when we learn that he is all powerful, when we learn that he is present with us, when we learn about his compassion for his people, and on and on and on, the more that we understand who God is and we celebrate that through praise and worship, our prayers are lifted up to God. Faith rises up within us and we're enabled to pray in ways that maybe we wouldn't in the natural realm. There's a lot to be learned here from how they prayed, but let's go to what they prayed. We have here an anatomy of a prayer for troubled times, if you will. One commentator writes, we're often reminded that they prayed, but here is an example of what the early church prayed. They begin with worship. And this is, I think, the best way to start. When you begin to pray, the best thing you can do is to get your mind on the Lord and who He is and think about His greatness and glory and His power and begin to worship and praise Him. Uh, It's the best way to begin our praying, and that's exactly where they start. Sovereign Lord. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You see what what they're doing. They're seeing that God in his creative acts and his care for his creation is the sovereign Lord over all things. What they're doing is they're lifting up the Lord. They're magnifying his name and his character. They're worshiping him. John Stott writes, before they, they came to any petition, they filled their minds with thoughts of the divine sovereignty. Isn't that good? When the world's spinning out of control around you, when it seems like you're coming up against opposition, when they don't understand what's going on, when we're feeling confused by the events of life, there is a sweetness in the realization that God is in control, that God is sovereign. And that's where they begin. Ah, sovereign Lord worship. Uh, Verse 24, you made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through your mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? You see, the psalmist is asking this kind of question too. These crazy, the nations are raging against the anointed one. The peoples are plotting in vain against God and his purposes. What a crazy thing that they are doing. You, you, they found themselves in the same kind of situation. The kings of the earth are rising up and the rulers are banding together against the Lord and against his 
anointed one. Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm that's looking forward to the coming of that Messiah who would come to set up the rule and reign of God. But the world isn't ready for that. The world wants to do their own thing. The kings of this world want to rage against God and against His will and His plan. And they turned to that psalm and said, we feel like the same thing is happening here. Sovereign Lord, the omnipotent ruler whose authority extends over all. Eckhard Schnabel writes, he's sovereign because he's the creator of all the visible and invisible realities. Heaven, earth, and sea, and everything in them. Creator and therefore sovereign king over the whole of it all. Um, Dean Pinter writes, God who creates all things is declared as sovereign over all things, even over the human affairs of those who rebel against him. <laughs> now that's what's interesting about where he goes next. He's going he's gonna to remember what happened at the cross and the events leading up to the cross. And in those, he's going to celebrate the sovereign working of God. So again, as I said, Psalm 2 that he's quoting here is a royal psalm, almost a coronation psalm for a Davidic king, which God promises the king victory over his enemies who are plotting against the new ruler. And in that psalm, it's asking the question, why? Why are these things happening? Why are people plotting against the Lord and his Messiah? And it's not so much a lament as it is a conviction. It's a sense of, this is futile. This is crazy. Why would the nations do this? Why would the kings do this? They have vain designs. It's not going to happen. He is in control. So their prayers begin with worship, celebrating the sovereign working of God. He's the creator. He's the sustainer. He's the one who's in control of all things. And even when life seems to be spinning out of control, we run to the fact that he is king and he is in control. And then they move on to some thanksgiving. And worship and praise and thanksgiving kind of all fits together. They remember what God had done in the most amazing way in the events that led up to the cross. Look at what they say in verse 27. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. It's a fascinating verse, isn't it? Um, Herod and Pontius Pilate were like the nations and the rulers that were plotting against the anointed one. They were plotting against him and ultimately it led to him dying on the cross. But what is fascinating is how God in his sovereign working was using this for his glory and for his plan to be accomplished. It was an evil and a wicked thing that Jesus was crucified, no doubt about it. But God used it to accomplish the salvation of all those who would put their trust in Christ. So what was meant for evil, God used for good. And so that, that's where he says in verse 28, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. <laughs> so even though it was evil and hard to understand, yet God was able in his sovereignty to turn it around to accomplish his purpose and his will. In essence, they're giving thanks to God for his amazing sovereign ways. How God is at work in human history, accomplishing things, even through the evil and the wicked acts of people like Herod and Pontius Pilate. It's hard to get our minds around how that can be, but God is ultimately sovereign, and uh, he is the king and the ruler over all things. And so, even when things are happening around us that we don't understand and seem unfair or unrighteous or unjust, yet God is at work and he is accomplishing his will. All things are indeed working together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. 
Now, I want you to notice something interesting here. God's sovereignty is never an excuse for fatalism. It's never an excuse for us to give up and to think, well, something, you know, it's in God's hands anyway, so, you know, I'm just let it go. God's sovereign care is an invitation to prayer. It's not an excuse for fatalism. It's not an excuse for inaction, for doing nothing. But rather, realizing that God is sovereign, and He has chosen to use our activities, including our prayers, to accomplish His will, His sovereignty gives us a reason to trust Him to accomplish what needs to be done. It gives us added incentive to trust Him for the promises of His Word, to accomplish His will. So it's a call to prayer, not an excuse for inaction, not a sense that I, it's going to happen, whatever is going to happen is going to happen, so why bother? You see, sovereignty breeds hope and expectancy in our praying. If God is truly over all things, if He's the source of everything and the one who sustains everything, if everything uh, is under His command and control, then that gives us reason to come to Him with hope. Do you get it? O oh, Sovereign Lord, You who created all things in heaven and on earth, all the created order, every, all the creatures and everything that's happened in human history, it's all coming about according to Your sovereign hand. So Lord, we're bringing our requests now to You. Stott again says, only now, with their vision of God clarified and themselves humbled before Him, they were ready at last to pray. After we've worshipped, after we've thanked God for where we've seen His hand at work, where we've seen His sovereign hand, after we've been humbled by His sovereignty, then we're ready to pray and to make our petition to God. And that's where we go next. After the worship, after the thanksgiving, then they have the petition. There's actually several petitions, several specific requests that they make to the Lord. And it's interesting both what they ask and what they don't ask. They don't ask the Lord to wipe them off the face of the earth <laughs> or to somehow retaliate against the chief, the head priests and the, the, the Sadducees. Nothing like that. And they don't even really ask for protection. What they ask for is that God would make them more bold than they were before. It's a fascinating petition. So let's take a look at it. In verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The first request was this, that God would consider their threats. Now, what does he mean? Consider the threats that were made by the Sadducees, and especially the, the, the Sanhedrin and these rulers of the temple, the, the chief priests and so forth. Remember the threats that they had made against them, that they should, they should stop preaching, that they shouldn't talk about Jesus, they shouldn't talk about the resurrection. Um, John Stott again writes, It was not a prayer that their threats would fall under divine judgment, nor even that they would remain unfulfilled, so that the church would be preserved in peace and safety, but only that God would consider them, the petitions, that God would bear them in His mind. <laughs> so Lord, think about, consider, pay attention to the threats that they made against us. It's interesting, they leave it with that. They don't exactly say how they want God to answer it, but remember those threats, Lord. Look at those threats. And look in a way that shows your concern for them. Um, the word that's used here, epide, is a, is a very unusual word for looking at something. And it's one that suggests looking with concern for the situation. Um, somehow... Lord, you do what you want to do, but intervene on our behalf, he seems to be saying. So look, Lord, do something about it. It's interesting, they, 
you know, they could have kept going with Psalm 2. If you remember what Psalm 2 is all about. They could have asked God to laugh them to scorn. Or terrify them with his wrath. Or break them with a rod of iron. <laughs> so that they perish or something like that. But that's not where the psalmist, or that's not where the, the praying goes in this text. They forgot that part of the psalm. <laughs> they left that part off, off of their prayer. But rather, they used the part that was more of a question. Why are the nations raging? sort of thing. So the first thing is, consider the threats, Lord. Consider favorably. Look on. Be concerned about our situation and do what you need to do. Secondly, the request was this, that God would enable them to speak the word even more boldly than they had in the past. Now, just consider where we've been. We've got Peter and John coming up against all these religious authorities and they had incredible boldness. Remember when, even earlier, Peter stood up in the end of Acts 2, and he preached the sermon of his life. He preached with boldness that he hadn't had before. So, realizing that this situation and the threats that had been made against them might cause the young church to back off in fear to stop going out and telling people about Jesus, to kind of hide in their homes and, 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 and to not witness or share their faith with other people, to not talk about Jesus and the, that they had been witnesses of resurrection. The temptation would be for them to keep quiet, to not take any chances, but instead they pray the other direction. Lord, make us more bold. Make us more bold than we've ever been. Enable us to speak the word with boldness. Um, and then the, the third petition is this, that God would stretch out His hand to heal and to perform miraculous signs and wonders in and through the name of Jesus. Now, what was it that got them in trouble in the first place? It was them doing a sign, a wonder. It was the healing of a lame man who had been lame for 40 years from birth. He was... The one found at the temple gates in that place where people would have seen him all the time. This man who had been there for years and years, begging at the temple gates, and an amazing miracle, they ask him to rise up. And he does, and his, his ankles grow strong, his legs grow strong, and he's able to walk. And then he leaps and he jumps and he praises God and testifies to the healing power of Jesus. It was a healing miracle, a sign and wonder that had gotten them in trouble in the first place. And here they say, Lord, keep getting us in trouble. <laughs> keep bringing those signs and wonders that will draw people to the name of Jesus. Now, remember that this request comes under the heading of God's sovereignty. And when it comes to signs and wonders, when it comes to miracles, and healings, we often have questions about why does this one heal and why does this prayer not answered and, and why did this person uh, experience a miraculous thing and this one didn't, that sort of a thing. We, we wrestle with those questions. Remember, it all falls under the sovereign care of his lordship. Um, we, don't, we don't ask for them on demand. <laughs> it's not ours to do so. There, but we are given the opportunity to pray for those people in need. And just like they did, it seems to me that we ought to follow the same pattern. If we find ourselves in a place of need, we ought to pray. We ought to bring our brothers and sisters together with us to pray and expect God to work on behalf of people. We don't know how for sure He's going to work in each and every circumstance, but we should take it to the Lord and leave it in His sovereign hands. He is all-powerful, and there's nothing too difficult for Him, and He continues to do wonderful things, miracles that are a sign of Jesus, the power of Jesus' name. He he continues to do so, um, and we continue to pray that he will continue to show himself powerful on behalf of God's people. Well, that's their prayer. What happened? What happened? 
after they prayed, it says. Verse 31. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I always love it when you see the answer to your prayer right away. Now, it doesn't usually happen that way. Usually, there's persevering and waiting in prayer before we see the answer. But here we see an immediate answer to prayer. After they prayed, first of all, something happened they didn't pray for. The place shook. I don't know if they were in Southern California when this took place or not, but it it sounds like an earthquake kind of thing was happening. But it's a sign. It's a part of of God saying something unusual is taking place here. God is powerfully present with his people, and the whole place shook. And I guarantee that they shook too (laughs) within. There's an inner shaking that sometimes takes place when we know that we're standing in the presence of a holy God. And that's what we see in the book of Acts all the way through, this manifest sense of God's presence that comes. Again, they're shaken, even as they were on Pentecost in Acts 2. Again, we see the similar kind of thing happen. Not all of the same signs are present, but again, we see here's the hand of God saying something unique, special is happening. The prayer is being answered. And then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, what's interesting about this is these are basically the same people who in chapter 2 were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that seems confusing at first, doesn't it? And we're going to see that later it happens again. (laughs) There are several times in the book of Acts where people often the same people, now maybe not completely exactly the same group of people, but some of the same people are at each of these events where they're filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, And what does that tell us? Well, I think what it tells us is that the filling of the Spirit, the being controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit, is something that we need on a regular basis. Paul taught us that we should be filled and continue to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember he said, don't be drunk with wine, which is an excess, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's in a continuous or a progressive sense. So it's filled and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he tells us in places like Galatians that we must walk in the Spirit. We must keep in step with the Spirit. So there is an ongoing relationship with God where he's controlling us by the Spirit. He's filling us. But there are new situations and new circumstances that we encounter, and every day we need a fresh filling from God. I prayed almost every day, Lord, I need you to fill me afresh, anew, with your Holy Spirit. Um, And indeed, that's what happened here. Once again, God met them, and in a fresh and a new way, He filled them with the Holy Spirit. It's not that they were leaky. (laughs) It's not that they had lost it or something. But he, in answer to their prayer to be filled with the Spirit, to be more bold in their witness, he fills them afresh and anew and with an increasing boldness to share their faith with others. And that's the third answer. Verse 31, they spoke the word of God boldly. They spoke the word of God boldly. Instead of being fearful, Instead of cowering in fear, instead of going back to their homes and never coming back out again, they spoke the word of God boldly. They continued their witness. Now, there's no answer in chapter 4 to that last petition, the signs and wonders and that sort of thing. But we don't have to go very far in chapter 5 and even beyond that, but even chapter 5, to find the answer to that request too. In verse 12 of chapter 5, it says, The apostles perform many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. So there it is. Um, Answer number 4 to their prayers. So when you get in trouble, people, what do you do? Well, get together with God's people and pray. Find the koinonia, the fellowship that comes as we pray together for each other and that we persist in prayer for God to meet the needs of one another. 
There is something powerful uh, that takes place when we turn to the Lord in prayer. Oh, people, our God is sovereign. He is king, and he's loving, and there's so much he wants to do in us and through us. And he does it as we turn to him in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, uh, make us a praying people. Whatever happens, whatever troubles we might encounter, whatever trials of life, whatever suffering, whatever persecution, may we turn to you, Lord. And may you fill us, enable us, embolden us, and use us. We pray, Father, that uh, we would always turn to you and find you to be the sovereign Lord, the one with whom there's nothing that's too difficult. So help us, Lord, to turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll sing a song before we go. Lord, I run to you.
I will run straight to you. Though my heart and flesh may fail, you're my ever-present help, my tower of strength, my portion evermore. So Lord, we So church, when you get in trouble, when you go through those times of trouble and pain and fear, turn to Him. Run to Him. Pray to Him. And turn to your brothers and sisters and ask them to pray with you as well. He's the sovereign Lord, and He's the one in whom you can put your trust. Well, have a great week. Amen.